But where is Eduardo? I miss him. Um, let's see. Is anyone's email open? Yep. You get the time wrong? It's actually um, scheduled is 11.05. If you look at the schedule, it's starting 11.05. Well, that's uh, Western time. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's our Western, the Western time zone. Well, actually, there was confusion because it says we start at, at 8 Central European or 2 o'clock, but we had mixed messages. But now it's, it's time to start. Do you think the people is now here or can you tell where are you? Oh, yeah, people. Okay. What does it, what does it say where people are? On your right side? Is okay. that the one? Yeah, it does say people there. I see no one though. So I mean, there are so many sessions. I I always <laughs> wondered how he's going to get an audience. So it might be that there's just no one here. Um, should we just get started? Or I mean, that's up to us. I think well, it's two o'clock. So, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, very timely uh, session on metaphysics, ontology in terms of war. And I want to welcome our very distinguished panelists. And uh, I want to thank Frank Jürgen Richter, our host for enormous creative work in putting this together, so many different panels. So thank you, Frank. And uh, I want to welcome Suzanne Burry, Christine Cuomo. Uh, Eduardo is not yet here, uh, Tedeus Metz and Robin Wang. Welcome to this conversation. And uh, I will, as a host, I'm, I'll introduce myself and I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves and remember, I'll use a little timer here to give you one minute warning to when five minutes is, is just to keep us on tabs together. So I'm Ashok Gangeen, I'm professor of global philosophy at Haverford College outside of Philadelphia. And uh, my, whole, my work has been, uh, I'm working at the frontier of global philosophy, which is a sense, not just global physically geography, but global in the sense of metaphysical ontology of worldviews and seeking to get to the depth of first philosophy in a global context. And I'd like to say a little about that and open up some themes for this amazing topic of uh, metaphysics ideology in times of war. And then we'll turn uh, to each of our distinguished panelists to speak on this and we'll follow it up with uh, 90 minutes altogether of, of deep dialogue. So my own journey as a global philosopher listening not only to tradition out of Heraclitus, Parmenides, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and following that dialectic all through the ages, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Barclay, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, and all the way into the contemporary 20th century, uh, all the way to Sartre, uh, Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell, Whitehead, and Heidegger, for example. These are just some of the names that I lived with for years. But not also, but going eastward to look into the depth of yoga tradition, Vedanta philosophy, ancient Hindu philosophy, all through the centuries, trying to bring the yoga technology to address the condition of war. The Bhagavad Gita of, uh, of the Hindu philosophy begins in a state of war, where the warrior, the war hero, Arjuna, breaks down on the battlefield, and Krishna, the voice of, of Logos, the voice of Om, of Brahman, of the source, happens to be his charioteer and guides him into the technology of yoga, which is what to come out of fragmentation, polarization, which leads to war and enter into the integral unified yogic space of tapping the zone, tapping reality as it really is, tapping the logos. That was uh, the, the Hindu tradition of ad addressing uh, wisdom. But Buddha, uh, Buddha's deep work in opening up a frontier uh, of Buddha's uh, ethics uh, has to do with suffering. When Buddha was enlightened, the Four Noble Truths that existence is suffering, it's broken down, it has a cause, how we're using our minds, our mental addiction. We have a choice, the third noble truth. We can change the way we're using our minds and, and, and work with a different integral technology to overcome the human suffering. And the fourth noble truth is, well, here's how we do it. We have to practice mindfulness 24 seven to rehabilitate our mental practices so that our mental practices really are the heart of our suffering and of all kinds of breakdown, polarization, suffering and war. Right, how we use our minds. That's one of the axioms of first philosophy. And, and going eastward to, to China, to Dao De Ching, and one of our speakers will speak uh, 
Robin will speak about that tradition. The Tao that is named is not the Tao. These great wisdom teachers are seeing that there's a missing language of logos. And if we don't tap the logos and we try to translate it, download it into our everyday forms of mental processing, we can blow the most important medicine of, of wisdom and remain in the fragmentation and polarization by being ad ad uh, addicted to a more adolescent form of rationality, small r, that objectifies and, and packages and atomizes and have mind bites and Lego pieces. And we live in that mental space. And my good wisdom teacher is saying, no, that is dysfunctional. We've got to upgrade our mental processing and, and rise to a, a more integral calculus. And I would call it the logos in the global space. And I'll have to stop in a moment, but I'm opening up the theme. But the, the, the tradition of first philosophy, metaphysics understood as first philosophy, the science of what is first, is attempting to get to the grammar of being. And what is being is infinite source. And what is it? Let's call it the logos. Let's use a, the, the Greek word, but we could use Om, we could use Ta, we could use Yahweh, Allah. These are all alternative names for what is first. And what is the grammar of what is first? Well, it's not an ordinary grammar. It's an integral calculus. And our great teachers are calling us to tap that calculus. And that's how we come into human flourishing and well-being. And we'll follow up on that. And I've said enough, and I'm going to give myself a little warning to stop. And uh, I shall stop here. And I'm going to turn this over now uh, with the, the talking stick to Suzanne Burry, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Constance, Germany. Suzanne, welcome. We'd love to hear from you. And your six minutes are on. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so um, I'm an assistant professor <laughs> and lived in London for 10 years. So I'm sort of LSE educated. I did my master's there, PhD there, and then I was an assistant professor there for a while. Then I had a child and moved back home to be close, close to what are now my child's grandparents, my own parents and my partner's parents. Yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to be here. Basically, I work on just war theory in a highly analytic tradition. And the very limited point that I want to make in my six-minute introduction is that if we take recent philosophical, analytic, philosophical, philosophical thinking on the just war seriously and combine this with taking ideology seriously. So we recognize that ideology is extremely powerful in the world that we live in, um, especially if combined with propaganda, so sort of ideology instrumentalized. So if we take these two seriously, then this should lead us to the conclusion that there is no such thing as a just war. So it's impossible, even though there's a just cause for going to war, it's impossible to fight a just war. Uh, but I want to say this sounds like I'm advocating pacifism, and that's not what I'm saying, actually. I believe that we live in a bad enough world that pacifism is at least not the obvious um, conclusion we should reach. It seems to me that maybe sometimes we need to get our hands dirty. So the idea is the war that we will fight predictably will be unjust, but we should fight it nevertheless. We should, so to speak, sacrifice our moral purity um, because of the highly non-ideal world that we live in. Okay, so how does this work? What's recent philosophical thinking on the just war? Up until the late 1990s, the basic idea in philosophical thinking about the just war was simply that the laws of war and the morality of war coincide. So if you're familiar with the laws of war, the idea is that this was also the morality of war. And according to the laws of war, we have an ideal of peace. Basically, the idea is all wars are prohibited. You cannot just fight one. But then wars of aggression will nevertheless be fought. So all wars of aggression, even though they're prohibited, we know sometimes they will be fought. And basically for this reason, because we know that the ideal of peace will not be upheld as a sort of concession, um, wars of defense um, are legally permissible or uh, as the case may be morally permissible as well. So basically there should be peace. Aggression is never permitted, but if it happens, defense against the aggression is permitted. And so these are not yet just wars. These are simply wars that have a just cause, namely the cause of self-defense or other defense. But for the war to then be just, you also have to fight it justly. So you have to just cause, but now you need to stick to certain rules when fighting the war for the war to be just. And according to the laws of war, the most important is the principle of distinction, where you distinguish between combatants on the one hand, who may be targeted, and civilians or non-combatants, on the other hand, who may not be targeted. They may at most be harmed as a side effect. Mm -hmm. 
And the idea was, well, combatants can be targeted because of their role that they play in the collective enterprise that is war. And then in the late 1990s, led by Jeff McMahon, we had what is now called revisionary just war theorist thinking, which rejected the collectivism that is inherent in the laws of war and the thinking up to then in philosophy about the just war. And revisioning, revisionary just war theorists just say that, yes, the only just cause for going to war is self-defense. But then they say, well, the principle of distinction, distinguishing combatants from civilians, it's basically crude at best, misleading at worst. Basically, the relevant distinction, and we should make a distinction, is uh, between those who are responsible for the unjust war and those who are not responsible, or to put it slightly differently, basically those who have some sort of culpability with respect for the fact that an unjust war of aggression is being fought, and those who are excused or simply non-culpable in some sense for the unjust war. And we should target only those who are culpable for the unjust war. And my point is now, if we take ideology and propaganda seriously. We think about the average combatant, young, um, susceptible to something like propaganda because they do not yet have, say, the life experience that make them appropriately reflective of what they're being told, that kind of thing. Many unjust combatants will have uh, an excuse. It's the excuse of reasonable ignorance. They didn't know, and reasonably so, given the power of ideology, that they were involved in an unjust enterprise. And the point is, if you're a just combatant, so you want to fight a, a war of self-defense, you cannot possibly, in combat, distinguish between those who are culpable and those who are not. All that you know is that many of the unjust combatants you're facing are not actually uh, morally responsible for the unjust war that they're fighting. And the point is then, well, then you cannot apply the principle of distinction that revisionist, revisionists want you to apply. You cannot distinguish the culpable from the non-culpable. And so if you're going to fight the war of self-defense or other defense, you inevitably will be targeting people who are not liable to be targeted, and hence you will be fighting an unjust war, even though you have a just cause for going to war. And again, we can conclude that we should be pacifism, uh, pacifists, excuse me, even in the highly non-ideal world that we live in. I actually think that's too strong. I think there can be wars that just have to be fought. We have to take a stand against evil, um, even though we know that we will be getting our hands dirty in doing so. Thank you. Well done. Good timing. Perfect. Again, thank you so much. And now we'll turn to Christine Como, the Professor of Philosophy and Women's Studies at the University of Georgia in the USA. Christine, welcome. Thank you. So I think hopefully this will be uh, a interesting follow-up because I do, oh, I'm going to, um, rather than uh, show my PowerPoint, I'm just going to put something in the chat um, because I do want to uh, let you know about this uh, article of mine, which I'm kind of assuming uh, uh, in my remarks. And um, yeah, I'd love for you to, to take a look at it. So in this, and then this is an article that actually has gotten uh, it's my most widely read article, which has really was like a side project right after I wrote my dissertation. Um, but uh, it's by far my most widely read because it is used quite a lot among uh, people working uh, in debate and students in debate uh, who are arguing about uh, just war theory. So my argument um, is that uh, war is not just, but war is not just an event. And so just war theory also hinges on locating the, you know, kind of identifying the acts and events of war. And my argument in this paper is that state political war, uh, especially in, uh, you know, imperialist capitalism uh, or perhaps just in any industrial state, uh, which could include the medieval industrial states, but state political war includes everyday military violence. Um, in this article, I show that this has particularly disastrous impacts for women, people of color, and the environment. So if we're looking at militarism rather than just war, along the lines of um, uh, theorists like Cynthia Enlow, political, uh, I'm sorry, feminist uh, theorist, uh, if we look from the perspective of women or the environment or disenfranchised communities, we see that military violence is happening every day um, and that 
acts of war, uh, you know, sort of real wars um, are really a, more a matter of what the state wants us to think is a real war. And, um, uh, you know, what, what wars count. So focusing only on official acts of war neglects the extent to which modern industrial nations are always uh, engaging in um, the evils of war. And therefore ethics and politics should assume that war in our times is not just an event, but a fundamental everyday state of political and ethical reality. So I am interested in the project of resisting war. So whether or not Suzanne's right that, you know, that sometimes we have to resist war with war and fight fire with fire, I'll bracket that question. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, the politics and the ethics of resisting war uh, and uh, from a feminist and environmental perspective, but uh, in any, any uh, uh, ideally anti-war uh, perspective will do. And so from the perspective of resisting war, I think the question is a question of love. What are the politics of love? Uh, what are we protecting? What do we protect? What's the basis of resisting war? And how can we use the politics of love to resist war. So this all uh, calls for the metaphysical questions that I'm interested in uh, talking about for a minute here, which is the metaphysics of the heart. The metaphysics of the heart, literally. So if metaphysics is the question, uh, quest philosophical questions about what is beyond or within what is seen, that is God's, souls, selves, minds, right? If metaphysics, uh, it, you know, that, that the work that it does is it, it can really kind of engage, take seriously these questions about what is, what is beyond or within what is seen. Um, then hearts uh, are a really wonderful um, candidate for some serious metaphysical uh, investigation. And I think um, perhaps even a celebration if, the mind is celebrated as it is in philosophy. Perhaps you could also uh, investigate so as to celebrate uh, and energize, learn more about the heart so that the heart could better function. The heart is, of course, a physical realm. It's a physical thing, uh, you know, like the world uh, or like the self. It's a physical thing, um, set of things with significant meta meanings. So the heart, the physical heart, uh, in most of our uh, spheres of meaning uh, is never just the physical heart. In fact, it might be talked about as the metaphorical, it's not really metaphorical, I'm saying it's meta, the meta heart might be discussed even more than the physical heart. We might think about and think from uh, and act from and of course feel from and within our meta hearts even more than we do our merely physical hearts. Of course, as a feminist, I'm also interested in the heart as a physical and metaphysical realm that is strongly associated with, if not completely identified with femininity. So the metaphysics of the heart, I think is very good work for feminist philosophy, which has already like, done a lot of work laying the ground for thinking about uh, the work of the heart, the experience of the heart, how hearts are in conflict, how hearts come together. Um, and uh, I think that feminist philosophy, any philosophy, uh, could really do some wonderful work in helping us figure out uh, what is true of the heart, or what is true of hearts beyond and within what is seen. Um, we might take work in philosophy of mind as a paradigm. I'm not so sure that that's going to be the greatest paradigm. And my argument for feminist philosophers taking this on is a sly way of saying I don't think that metaphysicians ought to take on, um, or, or I, I, I don't think that people who are working in mind necessarily are the right people to be turning around and working in heart without doing a bit of, uh, a bit of um, uh, rethinking of their uh, usual dualisms. Um, but the other thing about, that's interesting about the metaphysics of the heart is that it's, uh, I think it really calls for um, a, uh, a theory of knowledge or a practice of knowledge that is about listening. Uh, what do we do to hearts? So how, how do we know what's going on in hearts? We listen to hearts. We listen to the physical heart and we also listen to the meta heart. And so a philosophy founded in listening rather than thinking, knowing, seeing, putting together. But how can a philosophy of listening emerge? 
Can we switch now to- We need to, it's going over seven minutes now. Okay. I just wanted to then uh, leave on the note of pluralism uh, as a pluralist humanism as a praxis of the heart. Sorry, I didn't hear your, um, I, I was hearing uh, interference, so sorry I didn't. That's okay. all right, it's all right. Well, you, you know, Eduardo, uh, unfortunately, is not here as far as I can tell. And so I'm being a little more- It's an email that he's unable to get on. Oh, that's too bad. I thought we had worked that out. Thank you, Suzanne, for letting us start. So we'll continue now by having Tadeus Metz. I hope I pronounced that. Tadeus Metz, uh, Professor of Philosophy, University of Pretoria in South Africa. Welcome, uh, Tad. Please take it down, take the ball and go with it. Okay. I'm originally from the U.S. Um, and was trained in continental philosophy and uh, analytic ethics and political philosophy, but then moved to South Africa in 1999 and have been exploring African philosophy and more broadly non-Western philosophy since then. Um, and some of what I've done is taken an analytic approach to uh, African political philosophy and address just war theory at times, but that's not what I want to discuss today. Instead, I took a different tack. Um, I was um, uh, piqued, my interest was piqued by uh, this part from the blurb for our session. Uh, quote, we need to be able to judge priorities and goals, but who could stand in judgment? Uh, what metrics might be acceptable? The realities of war are often supported on one side by the right of their gods who ultimately have to be judged, but by whom? So I, I found that kind of epistemic issue of, of um, uh, 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 who gets to judge uh, of interest. Um, I think on the face of it, it would be nice to be able to judge uh, uh, issues of war and other international contestations by using a well-founded global ethic. So a global ethic in general is something like a collection of universal values uh, uh, or a morality that is justified for all parties. And the rub is how to cash out uh, 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 what kind of values might be universally uh, uh, justified. Uh, in the rest of my five minutes here, I'm going to look at three different interpretations of a global ethic. I will very quickly argue against two of them, and then I'll illustrate uh, the third. Uh, the main interpretation of a global ethic uh, is what I call an actual consensus model. And it says there are, in fact, some values that we already share. Uh, there's already common ground. Um, we already agree. Uh, often the golden rule is, is advanced as uh, an example. A uh, principle of respect for human life is often uh, a second kind of example. But I've got two problems. Uh, one is I actually doubt that there are any values that are universally accepted. Uh, there are some long-standing religion, religio-philosophies that reject uh, the sanctity of human life, for example. Uh, and furthermore, my other concern is that if there were some universal values, they would be too thin to do the kind of work that we want uh, when addressing issues of warfare. We're not going to get enough leverage out of them. A second approach to a global ethic, then, is uh, not to suppose we already agree, but that we could come to an agreement. Uh, so I call it the future consensus model, and the thought is we get uh, representatives of all the world's long-standing traditions together, uh, we stick them in a room, and, and over time they will come to an agreement, and that's uh, our, our global ethic. Um, but I'm doubtful that uh, our interlocutors would in fact come to a consensus, uh, no matter how long you stuck them in the room together. Um, I think there are too many uh, non-rational factors that influence debate, and I also think the rational factors might be too complex or admit of a pluralism that would prevent an actual agreement from forming. So that leads me to explore a third uh, interpretation of a global ethic, and I call it the hypothetical consensus model. And according to it, uh, uh, the universal justified values are those that would be reasonable to accept by adherence to all longstanding worldviews. It would be what would be rational for each party to agree to, given uh, her background, her a particular intellectual background. And so even though we don't actually agree with each other, and even though we would never in fact come to an agreement, there are certain things we ought to agree to in the light of our background uh, views. Uh, that's the model I want to explore further when it comes to understanding a promising global ethic. And here's one example of how it might work uh, in the context of warfare. 
Um, uh, as Suzanne pointed out, there are a number of different perspectives on uh, 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 whether war is justified. We've got pacifists who think it never is. Uh, we think, uh, on the other side, we've got those who think war is justified only to rebut actual aggression. Uh, then we've got uh, 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 salient uh, these days, uh, those who think that war is justified if there's simply a buildup of forces on a border, uh, regardless of whether an attack is imminent uh, uh, on the part of a Ukraine, for example. So we get different views uh, on uh, when it's just to go to war, for what purpose. Um, but I still think, uh, despite uh, the varied backgrounds, uh, these folks would have good reason to agree to the following kinds of principles. Uh, surely all of them could agree that normally a neutral third party ought to be the one to authorize whether to go to war. Uh, that could be something uh, uh, that all these positions could sign on to, even if uh, they would not, in fact, do so. And for another example, I think all these views could agree to the principle that normally a war should be uh, uh, last resort. Uh, we should uh, normally try other means. It should be uh, uh, the very last thing that we try, uh, having exhausted all the alternatives. Uh, so it might not be that these positions are actually accepted. It might not be that they would not, in fact, be accepted in the future, but they would be reasonable, I think, for any of these positions uh, to accept. Uh, and so that's to illustrate how the third notion of a global ethic might work. Um, and I think I will stop there. My six minutes are up. Well done. Thank you very much. And now we continue to develop the rich range of perspectives with Robin Wang, Professor of Philosophy, Loyola Marymount University, USA. Welcome, Robin. Thank you. Thank you for the cheer, for put a lot of work to it. And I also really enjoy all our participants' um, views. I found a lot of resonance with your view. So myself, um, trained in German philosophy, particularly Hegel, the absolute spirit. But as, as they gradually, uh, my... Um, professional life evolve, I'm actually more towards to Taoist philosophy. And uh, uh, so today I mainly want to talk about a, a my line it will be uh, uh, metaphysics against the aggression. So how I'm going to set up this now, what is my justification for that? So I would like to say first, let's look at the Taoist uh, uh, world view. What is the world is all about? And then what is the human's place in this cosmos, <coughs> in the world or in the reality? So because of quick, I have to do, concise it. So I will see according to Taoist view, the world is in connectivity. So everything is, is interconnected, interrelated. So that is, it's not this connectivity manifest, you, you know, the nature, the heaven, the earth, the animals, the plants, and the human being. We are all in this one place. So this one, so then what does that will to do with the human's actions? So one will question is the source of reason. How do we contemplate our life? How do we contemplate and understand the world? There is a mean, there is a way we can learn from that nature. So that one thinks that how about the, the idea of uh, uh, human behavior? So particularly here, we, we talk about the war, talk about the, I think that the course of war is aggression. This, now, what is the aggression? What is the, this problem, original aggression? is the sense of a control. It's a sense to expand it, the, your own, this uh, uh, understanding the reality. So in, in here, instead, and also most important things, I think in here, we think how do we solve the problem? Conflict, uh, opposition, and the tension is inevitable, but a solution is a multiple. So why we have to use control, violence, and to solve the problem? Could we find the alternatives? So, so this is what one of the alternatives I was saying earlier that talk about the um, a third year uh, solution to uh, <coughs> global ethics, and then we will we'll see probably in the Taoist idea will be used the word is suppleness or yielding, or this is the heart of love. 
right? So but there's a hard love in this more um, comprehensive and the more connected way to, to, to think about it. So we want to look at what is the uh, uh, cause of war. That is the funding a solution to solve the problem, the conflict. So another word, so actually Daoist uh, later on involved to this idea of uh, uh, art of war. This art of war is to see that the violence is and war is one of many options and that, was, uh, that should be last solution. So, so then the question is, how do, how do we do? How do we really uh, deal with the conflict and the, the um, you know, uh, this uh, a contradiction and the, the, the fighting at the different levels, right? State, community, individuals, and yourself. So what do you do? So one of the things I wrote a book on, on Yin Yang. So one of the things Yin Yang talk about is, is the giving and the take. Another word is to reposition yourself. Reposition of, and then trying to feel about it and then trying to get a solution for all. So I, I, all the party will become here to on the table equally and uh, uh, their interests taking into account and then found the best way for the all. So this is one of uh, things. And then I, I'm not sure, do I still have time? Could I read Dao Te Ching chapter 76? Oh, it's, uh, it's my time is up. No, one minute, one minute. Oh, one minute, okay, quickly. One minute so, there. yes. Okay, so he, here is the, that's the back to idea source of reason, right? So here the Dao Te Ching said, when men are, human beings are alive, are supple and soft. Dead, they are stretched out to reach the end, hard and rigid. The same thing, 10,000 things. We see grass, we see tree, a supper, and the light, a plant. But then the dead, they are dry out, the brittle. So, so, so therefore, hard and rigid are companions of life. Oh, sorry, companion of death. Sorry, supple and the softness, the delicate and the fine, and the companion of life. So clearly to tell us, you know, Basing on the empirical experience we see in plants, in um, a, a, in trees, and in human life, the sign of death is a hardness, it's a stiffness, and then the sign of life is it's a softness, a suppleness. But that's the one thing. Secondly, giving a time, softness, suppleness will be. It's a source of power. Will come overcome strong and hardness. It's just like the image of water. So here we think about the water can run, given a time will through a the rocks. So this this kind of reasoning actually give us provide us a different strategy to dealing with world problems. It, it's it's like a chase. I don't uh, a ch chess is called a goal. You know, the, another word, the power, it's not the line on control, but rather influence. So how do we influence gradually to not, not the means take up your king, take up your, you know, important plants, but rather gradually, gradually take up, you know, to building up your potentiality, potencies, and then to result, then to getting a result effect. Of course, that's the economic system we see is a win-win situation. But you, it does not, it does not matter how you feel it. So we look at the result, we look at the path, then we look at the uh, uh, cause. Uh, so that that's how this whole package of metaphysics against uh, um, aggression. Thank you, Robin. And uh, I regret that uh, our other friend Eduardo. Mandira, uh, Penn State University wasn't able to get in. Uh, very interesting topic. I'm beginning to hear resonances of, uh, amongst our voices about uh, the logic of the heart, the logic of, of uh, the, the subtlety and fluidity and yieldability. And I would, he I would call it a dialogue rather than rigidity of monologue that can, can block and lead to uh, ideological wars and, and uh, the fragmentation uh, deep in the consciousness 
And um, I'm listening to Suzanne's point about, uh, you know, we're living in a real world. The idealism is great, but but maybe we have to engage in, in wars uh, until we can work work this out. And uh, and Tad's uh, great attempt to find a global ethic and not see it's just not a matter of agreeing, you know, and uh, by, by our will. But maybe there's something higher than our will that we must, uh, how we ought to agree. Uh, that odd question, uh, really, if, if there is a logos, if there is a deep ontology of logos presiding over all of our narratives, but it's a question I'm raising, then maybe uh, to, to yield and listen to the logos, the guidance of logos, the light of logos, the light of reason, is where we will find the deeper moral law. Not a matter of according to our wills, but if there's a higher logic uh, of the heart to, to, to bring in uh, Christine's theme and uh, and, and Robin's uh, theme about the Tao and the fluidity and, and the, not the rigidity, but, but, but she brought up heart and love too. I'm hearing themes together. And I wish that Eduardo could be here. His topic was philosophy's war, nomos, polemos, topos. And I might just take a moment to honor him and just say, if you don't mind, I hope you start with you, to, uh, from his short, uh, to, to, to say, he said, from among all the fascinating topics, at the 2022 uh, Horace Global Meeting, I thought that this was the most appealing for me for the philosophical reason. First, when I read the title and abstract, I immediately thought of two aphorisms which are closely related. One from Heraclitus, quote, war is father of all and king of all. He renders some gods, others men. He makes some slave, others free, unquote. And the other is from Carl Schmitt, so, unquote, Sovereign is he who decides the state of exception, who is friendly or enemy, unquote. He says Heraclitus, this is uh, Eduardo, Heraclitus, more than 2,000 years ago, seemed to argue that war is at the root of all. Schmidt, the crown jurist of the Third Reich, thought that he who decides between friend and enemy is who struggles for the wall of the city as he as he were fighting for the laws of the city, which is another aphorism of Heraclitus. So here we seem to have two versions of a metaphysics of war. And in this sense, philosophy has been thinking war since its inception in ancient Greece. In fact, and here's a second philosophical reason, there is a way to think the history of philosophy as a history of the great conflicts of human history every major philosophical paradigm, he continues, shifts, I'm almost halfway through his abstract, shift, uh, shift was catalyzed by some major war. The Greeks against the Persians, the Athenians against Spartans, the Romans against the Greeks, the Romans against the Isra Israelites, the barbarians against the Romans, and so on, until our own times. The Russians against the West, each one of these major and decisive wars gave us unique philosophers, Herodotus, Socrates, Plato, Augustine, Aquinas, Victoria Suarez, Machiavelli, Kant, Hegel, Heidegger, de Beauvoir, Rawls, Walter, he goes on. And then he says, finally, I'll conclude, they were, they were all philosophers of war, and their philosophies were in, indelibly marked by the war they either participated in or witnessed. Nomos, as it were, was transformed to polmos. These philosophers philosophized the war of their times. And at the same time, they saw themselves as warriors or soldiers, either factually or figuratively. And this third philosophical reason, the philosopher has always conceived his her vocation as a struggle, polmos, a veritable war against ignorance, hubris, orthodoxy, idolatry, infidelity, genocide, etc., and the fourth philosophical reason has to do with the transformation of war itself. It has become more lethal, more destructive, more insidious, and thus more dehumanizing, brutalizing, and animalizing. War's intensity, lethality, has to do with its expansive reach. And he goes on to conclude, war, in short, has transformed the ground, territory, land, and earth in which we dwell. War transformed the topos of terrestrial existence. I wanted to honor Eduardo, by sharing that very interesting theme. So, friends, thank you so much. Um, let's let's pause and open up space for dialogue.
And I'd like to maybe start off with one of the themes, I mean, the question of a global ethic. What would be the most appropriate way to think how we ought to agree? Or Suzanne's point about uh, you know, war is inevitable, given where we are as humans. There's no justifiable, because ideology and the ideological mind, I mean, have, that's the theme I'd like to explore. What makes an ideology an ideology? And is it a pejorative value-laden concept to say that's just ideology? Right, and uh, if we're living ideology, and our youth are under the influence of ideology, for example, in propaganda, you know what that stirs, that creates a cloudy area of what is justifiable, or and so forth. That's a theme I hope we we'll, we'll, uh, approach as well. But let's start off with the question of love of the heart. I really was moved by that, the logic of the heart, and and uh, because I heard Robin and Chris, Christine both uh, bringing that up, and it was implied in a way uh, by Tad. So. Uh, either of you, uh, Christine, would you like to comment and, and take up the ball? Let me throw the ball yeah. over you. Yeah, thanks. Um, great. Uh, what 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 a, a cool conversation that, that everyone is sort of addressing. I think similar, similar kind of questions. Or well, we're all addressing the same reality that we are political reality that, that we're living in and that we share. Um, and uh, I think that uh, Eduardo's uh, reminders too about the role of war in the history of philosophy and kind of our our, our home method and discipline. Um, but I, I really uh, I want to reintroduce the the note that I um, that I ended on, which I think is very fundamental for how I'm thinking about metaphysics of the heart, and uh, just really push on this question of pluralism. Uh, that is pluralism. Which, as a response, not just to uh, a, a a monologic, um, and I I I have to say I have a bit of a problem with like a, the the logos, the logos that can be known through reason. Um, and so, but I also want to question the the duality. So uh, Alfredo uh, Morales in the comment mentions uh, Romeo and Dul and Juliet, and that is how we think about war. Uh, that you know um, the you know the two sides that are fighting. But um, especially in our world, but I think maybe always, it's never just two sides. There are sides within the two sides. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, the, the thinking through a, a pluralist metaphysics at every level, I think, uh, is really going to open up some questions. And it will help us address plurality in ways that do not devolve into a complete relativistic free-for-all like you know twitter um that that is truth on twitter <laughs> or truthiness um so we need to think about how to how to really do pluralism and engage pluralism the right way i show i heard you opening on the theme of pluralism in our discussion before the panel began when you were talking about a variety of religious and epistemic traditions being, you know, needing to engage each other. And it's never just one, it's never just Christianity versus Buddhism, right? That that the, and, and then there's never just one Buddhism, there's never just one Taoism. And so I just think that we need to get get wise about, um, and, and really just kind of face up to the pluralities of, um, of being and including the pluralities within. Um, and that also helps us think about, you know, war and maybe either resisting, um, you know, resisting war or figuring out how, if we if we do have to get in to the dynamics of war, as Suzanne is suggesting, then what do we do with the moral remainders? I mean, that's just, how, you know, how do we do that and how do we pick it up? Look at what we've just learned about the U.S. and Afghanistan. I mean, like, how, how, how do you see it all the way through? And what what are the ethics of that? So I think that pluralism is really going to help. I have just let me end on a question for Robin. Um, Robin, when you were talking, I can't wait to read your book on yin yang, and um, your framing of war as control. Mm -hmm. I wanted to question that because I think that what about when the aim of war is elimination, you know, genocide, mm -hmm. uh, and t you know, taking your land. That's it. We just want to, I don't care who's there. Let me just eliminate them so I can get their stuff. I don't even want to, I could care less. Um, so, uh, it, and that, that's what causes the problem. 
uh, around your, your idea of suppleness, I'm working, I, lo I love that. And thanks for that reminder. I'm working with uh, the idea of accommodation mm -hmm. uh, rather than, r rather than um, uh, yielding, mm -hmm. uh, but accommodate, because like I can, I can, I can still be there <laughs> and accommodate rather than yielding because it seems a little, uh, as like that, it just goes yeah. against my feminism to like want to yield. Um, but uh, you can't accommodate if they're trying to kill you. You don't want to. You're not going to accommodate, which goes back mm -hmm. to Dan's point. It's like, oh, Annie, get your gun. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Um, it, it, control seems to me to be a bit of a euphemism uh, in our times. I just want to, uh, just before we go to Robin, just I really appreciate your many, many questions. And I want to get back to the question of when I speak of the logos, I'm not speaking of the ordinary small L. I'm talking about the source of all of our worlds and the pluralism. I think it's a huge question. Because I mean, we say America, for example, is going to serve as a multicultural society where there's fat, rampant pluralism. And but if, if it's a, a pluralism of silos of separate uh, Lego pieces and units that cannot connect, then that's destructive. So if we can have a genuine diversity without the unum power of the logos, we're going to be scattered and broken. So that you've hit uh, a key factor. We'll have to get back to that later, Christine. But when I speak of the, the logos as a source of all of our worldviews. The, the, that has infinite diversity within it. And that's a, that's a unemplorabus. And uh, I, I just want to say that and let it go. So that's, uh, Robin, I'd like you to uh, speak okay. in the of our yes. two other um, Okay, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so there's so many issues. I hope I can get the whole thing together. So let's just start the, uh, Christine, the idea of polarism. I think it's a very good idea. So from there, then I will do metaphysics of heart. I actually want to do meta metaphysics of body. So heart is just one part of human, the, the body. So I want to see the, the, the mind and then spirit and the physical form, the, this the circulation of your body to all together. So I will see uh, um, but, uh, metaphysics of uh, body will comprehensive for these issues. Now, then at the same time, that's a great question about the, my idea about the control, the war is control. So I think maybe I should add on, you're right. So war is not just the control, it's the one kind of manifestation of desire greedy. So like see, control is one manifestation of human desire. So one of the things the Tao is the, against is um, against the human desire. And also, those that talk about the other gene talk about three treasures. One is a compassion. That's the number one compassion. Secondly, simplicity. If your land is to get enough, you can be self sustained. It's good. Do not uh, expansion. Third is uh, not uh, moderation and also not go and conquer another place. So I was thinking earlier that the Adoro's idea of Greek philosophy, think about the war is the father of all things. I think that the view is wrong. It's wrong in the way that I'm talking about the Greek philosophers. They are painting this reality has limitations in this way, I will say. So I want to take them critique to look at. Is the war, of course, there is... Uh, historical and also apology and all kind of reason, cultural reasons to they, they come up with this idea to think about okay, it's all about we are in, it's all about fight a war. So because they are hunters culture, they, they have all this reason lead to that view. Then I will see their view has limitations the that's nicely to see. I say wrong will be that effect the our, how we see the world. So instead, maybe we look at the Taoist idea as a farmer's version of reality. We need the sunshine. We need the water. We need the location. We need the, you know time, earth to sustain our life. So we need many elements to work together to sustain our li livelihood. So if you really look at China's tradition, Chinese tradition, China has in the Tang Dynasty 900 
years before that time, and they now there is isolated case, right? There is a case the expansion, but、uh, they have an internal war, yes, but not, they are not expanded. So I was thinking if they going back, their original thought, Dao's vision of reality, the war can be limited in the way. Okay, then that's dealing with human greedies, dealing with human the violence to bring the、uh, conflict. So the, another word we talk about the word, we will see we should lock in the particular、uh, definitions about the war. The war is use violence, right? Use violence, destructive forces to、uh, solving the problem. Maybe that's the one kind. I don't know what else war we are we are looking at. You know, we haven't narrowed down the definitions in the idea. So, I, 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 okay. I noticed that they said that we're we're off,、uh, but we can continue. I see、uh, two mics.、Uh, Suzanne is there. You are good. Well, let's let's have, invite Suzanne in. Then we're going to go to Ted、uh, to hear your voices. And、uh, I'd like to keep coming back and seeing some emer- emerging themes for our dialogue. Suzanne, comments、uh, so far. What, what do you see in the conversation? Yeah, I have questions for everyone. <laughs>、um, to、uh, Robin and Chris, I would like to. Ask you to explain your ideas of subtleness and、uh, Chris called it resisting war politics of love. Like just what this would look like. I mean, the example I keep going back to is in Walzer's Just and Unjust Wars, where he basically argues that、uh, India's intervention in the Pakistani genocide of、uh, Bengali people in 1971 was obviously just, and I have a hard time not agreeing. So.、Um, I mean, I'm sure you all know what's going on, but、um, Pakistani people or the army just started killing Bengali people in what was then East Pakistan, and India <laughs> intervened according to Walter with the agenda, partly not just of stopping the genocide but of weakening、um, Pakistan as well. So they had some sort of ulterior motive, but basically by intervening, let's say violently. They were reasonably quickly able to put an end to the genocide, so it was really a successful war of、um, ending a genocide. And so, what would subtleness? And I really don't mean this. I don't know, ironically or rudely. Like, what would this look like? What does it mean? And how could it take an effective stand against? Like, this is unacceptable. This cannot go on. If Especially, there is an alternative where it seems we could reasonably well put an end to this by using violence. And similarly for the politics of love, so that would be my question to the two of you. To Ashok, my general question is just: to me, you seem to be talking about transcendence. There's sort of ideology, and then there's logos. And like, how can we know that we have reached logos and are not still stuck in an ideology? What sort of the, <laughs> the criterion to know we have? We're in this other、um, touch with reality now. That would be my question because it seems very important to reach locus. But how can we ever know? And to Tadeus, my main question is something like: I, if I understood you right, the global ethics is about what we can all agree to. And your point was something like: even though we have very different ideas about just war or maybe also pacifism, there are actually are things、um, reasonably specific or concrete things that it seems to you. We would be agreeing to, and then my question is something like, yeah, on the principles, but never on the implementation. So, who actually counts as a neutral party,、um, or on the interpretation of the principle? Is it now last resort, and、uh, how to deal with that? Because I see you're very pragmatic. You're really trying to find the global ethic that works, and. <laughs> I'm the pessimist in this room.、Um, <laughs> it's just that when it comes to interpretation, especially once the conflict is about to escalate,、um, just this implementation interpretation question: How can we keep making sure that there's agreement? So that would be my three questions, given your opening speeches. Thank you. We're going to go back to that. Let's step in and reflect on your question to him, but the other remarks, and we'll come back. And Robin to answer the questions about the, 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 our love, the, the, the ethics of love,、uh, politics of love, and、uh, suppleness、uh, of the heart, and how it speaks to your questions, Suzanne. So, Tad, jump in, please, and and、uh, what's on your mind here?、Um, I I think I've got 
much more pessimistic views of human nature than than at least three of our discussants here. Um, um, I mean, I, I just, I'm doubtful that many of us can become yogis or mystics or monks or have the kind of Socratic insight uh, 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 that's available to some. Um, I doubt so many of us can be uh, supple and compassionate in the requisite way. Um, I, I doubt that uh, many of us with hard patriarchal shells are going to be able to really listen to our hearts. Um, um, I think there's a lot of vainglory, as, as Hobbes would put it. Uh, there's a lot of ego, there's a lot of delusion, and there's a lot of a tendency to view uh, uh, people uh, as outsiders and as pollution. And I think those are probably unavoidable facets of human nature. And so while I'm, I'm drawn to the idea that, you know, yes, in my own life and in my son's lives, I would like them to, to be uh, as the three of you described, um, I don't know that it can be universalized. I mean, I don't know that we can expect even a majority of human beings to live in that way. Um, and so I, I worry um, that we're still going to have a significant minority of people causing trouble. Um, uh, and we need some way of... of uh, of grappling with them. Uh, and that was more or less, uh, I think, uh, the question that uh, Suzanne posed. I do have one question for Suzanne, which is um, what, what she thinks about innocent threats. Um, so if a, a psychotic, uh, somebody's had a psychotic break for no fault of his own and is coming at me with a knife, um, uh, uh, can't I respond? Uh, justifiably uh, with deadly force to protect my life. And if that's okay in that case, uh, where there's no culpability at all for the sake of argument, then surely in warfare, one would think uh, I would be permitted uh, to uh, use deadly force to protect my own life uh, against those who are somewhat culpable, even if not uh, culpable enough to count as responsible. Um, uh, yeah, uh, those are my those are my impressions at the moment. Well, thank you, Ted. And, uh... I, I, this is as much there, and we're going to circulate and come back. So, Suzanne, keep that uh, question in mind. I'm going to go to Christine and Robin in a moment. And um, I just wanted to su suggest a theme I'd like to come back to eventually, but I'm going to defer is that the, the Logos tradition, in my sense of global, is calling us because of interconnectivity of reality that Robin uh, spoke of. If, if, the, if the essence of reality, a, a being, and that's what metaphysics is seeking, the grammar of being. If it's, and the consensus resonates across the planet of Buddha, yoga, Socrates, Plato, uh, about wisdom, global wisdom, connectivity, the I thou principle, that it's, it's not just lighthearted. If we humans are not Lego sapiens, separate silos and units like a Lego piece, but woven in to the fabric and we don't know how to do it, and we are connected in, in the way Buddha suggested, then to really be a person is to be an I thou, to see the other with yourself and with nature. And that that's the ethic we're looking that we ought to agree to if we understood the ontology of it, uh, rather than the, the, the informationized version of ourselves where we objectify everything as I and it, as Buber would say, I, it versus I thou. And I think that's uh, haunting in the back. To, to me, the subtleness is not weakness. It's, it's moving with the I thou flow of reality, of the deep ontology. And that's the politics of the heart that I'm hearing from, from Robin. So I want to throw the ball back to both of you, Robin and Christine. Christine, you take it. We're going to circle back to Suzanne to respond to Tad. But uh, Christine, uh, you've got the talking stick. Go for it. Yeah, great. Um, I, so you might, I did not make a pacifist argument. And I was, but I'm, I'm interested in, uh, you know, the metaphysics that are connected to uh, the politics and uh, perhaps even the ontology of resisting war. So even if war, wars are inevitable or wars are happening, some of us want to resist them. Maybe we want to resist war in general, or maybe we want to resist militarism, which is what I'm actually interested in. So uh, I don't believe in uh, human nature, and I am not a universalist. So I think that there are many again, the pluralism all the way through. Um, but it's not, a, it, it's not, it, it, it could be a pluralism that it could be determined, that we could, you know, investigate. So what are various aspects or forms of human nature? I think that one thing about most humans these days is that we are also plural within. So, you know, your most hardened uh, patriarch does listen to his heart. I know him. I've been there. Uh, so, uh, and that, that plurality 
within is actually the root of where we can kind of get a little bit of traction in thinking about, uh, you know, through, through the knowledge, well, what does it mean to listen to the heart? And do I want to be better at that? And how will maybe uh, convince the middle to better patriarchs? It might actually in this particular context, but I think that that the that the plural I I, I want the pluralism sort sort of everywhere. Um, I um, in terms of accommodation, so I I re was resonating with uh, with that for Robin because just thinking philosophically more about like okay, there's like.